baby's home Cairo Cairo is my baby's home One bad Cairo night won't be long Women and Cairo They will treat you kind and sweet Women and Cairo They will treat you kind and sweet Catch you around and take you off your feet and knock you, teach you, and cut you too. Shoot and knock you, teach you, and cut you too. They get through the graveyard then for you. Yeah, 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 Mac is back. Hey, everybody, and welcome. Albert, Cleveland, Ohio. Now I've placed you a bit closer in the States. You're quite close to my buddy Milovan, who lives in, uh, he's also sometimes in the street, in, in the live stream. Um, he lives in Cincinnati. So, welcome, great to see you guys. All right, already, the answer to, to the question for today. Yes, I think I deserve it, but can I afford it? <laughs> That's a good one. Hello, Gray, and welcome. Right, so, um, What's going on, everybody? I got a good stream for you today, and it's going to be a, a good discussion, I hope. The thing about this with the deserving the gear, instruments, and in this particular case, we're going to be talking about acoustic guitars, of course. Um, yeah, a little bit of housekeeping again. Uh, if you're watching this from Facebook, None of you is doing that, but if people come from Facebook, uh, yeah, they should go to YouTube. It's better audio and video as well. So, uh, the, the, the title for today's live stream was a bit, some, somebody told me, it's a bit clickbaity. Like, you, you really want to intrigue people. Like, w what does he mean with that? Uh, Parkwise, 
a little bit of that, of course, because I like I like to discuss these things, and there are some f issues when it comes to sustainability of us socially, financially, and you know, artistic. If 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 a great instrument can can you know contribute to to better performing, better sound, or whatever aspect is actual, we'll see. But the, the question for today, later on, are going to be, when is my instrument good enough? When am I good enough? Uh, cheap versus expensive gear. Pro versus beginner gear. And uh, the reasons for, uh, there are two reasons why I'm talking about this today. Uh, one of them is just because I'm planning the trip to Gothenburg in Sweden next, this coming weekend. And it's going to be an event called uh, gotguitars.com. And uh, let's see if something here will work. If I can just send you this. Uh, oh yeah, I can do that. So uh, I prepared this little link, where, which you can just like, open in another tab of your browser. Don't leave me. And then uh, you can have some more info about the place. But it's, it's a uh, guitar fair. A trade show where people can sell and buy their uh, instruments. We're gonna have a bunch of vintage stuff. Uh, uh, people who are organizing the whole fair uh, own a music shop in Gothenburg and they are the best in this west part of Sweden when it comes to uh, you know, getting uh, used fantastic vintage instruments that they can offer in their shop to people who want to buy them. That's a very good uh, thing to do, of course. So, uh, and the other reason is uh, my good buddy Tom Buck, who was a guest on my live stream a couple of weeks ago, this year, and he was actually uh, having a video. He did a video about Roadcaster Pro, which is a mixer, uh, audio mixer, audio interface, uh, live streaming machine, on steroids, uh, which is like um, the theme uh, for that was like, is it worth it? Is it worth buying an interface and a machine that's that expensive? Because it goes between like six and eight hundred dollars, depending on where you buy it. Here in Sweden, it, it costed me around eight thousand six hundred Swedish crowns, which is roughly eight hundred dollars. So it's 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 a lot of money. And then, credit to Tom, he also had this uh, podcast episode uh, that was called a Beginner versus Pro Gear. The Art of Diminishing Returns. Uh, yeah, but let's go on with the live stream. And to start off, we'll do the usual backup. Let's warm up. Standard tuning E. Let's do it. Slow blues in E. Okay. Two, three, four.
And the reason why I'm playing uh, this intro back up on this particular guitar is because now we're coming to the first section of today's live stream where I'm going to be presenting you my instruments starting from my main guitar which is this one made by Michael Sandin and it goes really well along with the theme for today because this is a handmade guitar and uh, it's one of those more expensive models because it's custom made and uh, designed by Michael but still I wanted some special measurements on this guitar which I will be showing you in a brief moment so this is um, this is one of his so-called SRB small round body uh, models he's got the VRB which is a middle model and then the JRB which is the jumbo and the jumbo is my baritone guitar so that's the shape difference in between those right so I'm gonna be showing you uh, my, my guitars uh, one by one so today the turn is on this one so let's see how we could do it uh, one of the main reasons why I want to show you all, all these instruments is first of all because I want to brag no but uh, I'm getting a lot of questions, especially when I'm playing live and then uh, in some contacts when it comes to these live streams and people asking me, oh, I saw this, you know, metal body guitar you're playing, like, what, what, which model is that? Who, who made that guitar? Can I buy it somewhere? And uh, we'll come to that one as well. But this guitar, this particular one is Sandon SRB, and you can see it here on the camera wonderful grains in the wood this is uh, the back and sides are made out of East Indian rosewood right then the top is a spruce average material used uh, I don't know where the spruce is coming actually the, we'll see in, in the specs I will show you that in, in, in a second but then we got the bridge uh, that's made out of Brazilian rosewood which is now very very rare in, in new built guitars because it, you just cannot cut it anymore you can't make it so this has got the Brazilian rosewood and you know the reason why guitars where the sides and the back of the guitars are made of Brazilian rosewood the reason why they are so expensive is because they really add you this almost like a sub bassy dimension of the sound this guitar has a wonderful sound it's beautiful rosewood with spruce sound but if I play this this let's say E chord if I play that with a Brazilian rosewood uh, guitar then the bass would be even more prominent but not taken over it's this smooth fantastic a thing an aspect and a dimension of sound that's really worth those couple of thousands of dollars that you pay for guitars that are made out of Brazilian rosewood but this one is East Indian rosewood that's it the neck is Honduras mahogany as it used to be uh, before and then the neck the fretboard is ebony with the Avalon inlays on the third, fifth, seventh, and ninth fret, which you can see like this. And what I love about how Michael did this is that he he made uh, the one on the third fret a little bit smaller, and then the fifth fret is a little bit bigger, and then bigger, and the biggest of those on the ninth fret, and then everything finishes off with this wonderful butterfly, which is Michael Sandin's uh, trademark. That's his logo. The peg head, it's got this wonderful veneer that's also rosewood, but underneath that, that's uh, the you know mahogany, which is underneath, right? And then what we got more? We got Waverly tuning machines that are great, really fantastic. One thing you need to be uh, aware of when it comes to Waverly machines is that. Uh, after many years of use and many tunings uh, and everything these knobs can all of a sudden just kind of start spinning into the empty nothing's happening 
So what, what I've done is that um, it's just the materials that are worn out and uh, the knobs here on the two new pegs are made out of wood. They're beautiful, but they worn out. So what I did is that I uh, kind of sanded a little bit of the uh, of a match, the wood for the matches, right? I just kind of sanded it a little bit and made it into a very fine powder. And then you take off this little knob, you fill it with these, uh, with this powder, and then you put a drop of super glue into that hole. And then fast as hell, you just put it back on the, this metal little part here and just keep it there. And now it's holding perfectly, so it's good. I'm um, golden. Go. Um, right, so the guitar, and uh, let's say compared to my length and my body size, this is how a big guitar is. All right. That's it. But what I want to show you here is my. Um, is the specs this is a piece of uh, paper that Michael uh, gave me when, when I received the guitar so what you see here is a little translation of these Swedish expressions the guitar sit on which is uh, uh, spruced up right and then everything else I've told you now the the binding on these this this part here this binding, which is a bit uh, brighter in color, that's maple. So it's a maple binding. And then inside, just a little bit next to it, I can show you that's the herringbone. So the top of the guitar finishes up here, then you get this herringbone binding, and then the maple binding. These are beautiful things, but they don't really affect the sound. What affects the sound is how the ribs in the guitar are made, how the wood is glued together, how well all the surfaces go into each other when they're glued and, and, and so on. So these kind of uh, jewelry that's on top of everything is just because of the beauty of it and because a guitar builder is so fantastic and, and really good at, at, at his craft. And um, But basically this is a very low profile guitar. It doesn't scream anything fancy and uh, the main main thing about this is the sound. And the reason why I, if, if, if you look at the specs here, uh, this is a neck width. This upper measure 45.5 millimeters, that's right at the first fret. So it's up here, that's the width of the neck. And then on the 12th fret, it goes uh, successively, successively uh, wider and it comes to 55.5 millimeters, which means it's a kind of standard progression of the size over there, but this is a little bit wider uh, neck than on average acoustic guitar. I think it's like a millimeter and a half maybe, maybe it's 45, maybe it's half of a millimeter. I don't really know, but I kind of like it this way. And there's also this other thing, that the profile of the neck, you know, how thick the neck is. Some older guitars have these V-shaped necks. They go like this in the back, right? So you almost feel it like cutting you in the palm of your hand when you're playing, which is a great feel, you know, but, uh, and many old guitars from the 30s and 40s were made that way. But this, this neck is a kind of a, it's a modern neck and it's a, it's very comfortable to play, which is great, of course. Then what else could be uh, interesting? This binding, I told you, that was maple, there was herringbone, and basically nothing else. I'm not showing you the price, of course, because that's between Michael and me. And then it was delivered to me in, actually in December, because I couldn't pick it up earlier, uh, 2005, which means that this guitar is 17 years old now. I can't 
believe that <laughs> it's 17 years ago, soon 18, 18 years ago that he made it for me and I've had it. Uh, one, one more reason why this guitar is so important to me was uh, this was the first guitar that I really ordered uh, according to my own specs because I always felt like I wanted a small guitar, small bodied guitar, but with a bigger sound, not louder, just a bit bigger. Those lower mid frequencies on the guitar. Uh, I wanted them a little bit more prominent, a little bit not bassy, but there, right, to, to get this nice and smooth sound. If you were in the room with me now and you could hear this guitar, it's not the same thing as I'm going through these, albeit really, really good studio microphones and a great interface. But there is a compression on the way from my room on YouTube, right, and to your computers, and depending on what you're listening with. If you're listening through your earphones, headphones that are good, then I guess the sound is really good. But it's not the same as if you were in the room with me. Um, what else is there to say? Yes, you see the depth of the guitar. It's, uh, I think it's around 12 centimeters, and that's much more than, than usually, let's say, down to here, maybe somewhere there, that's the uh, how wide the guitar is as a regular SRB model. This is as deep as a jumbo, and that gives it this nice, boomy, uh, soft bass frequencies, especially when you play chords like... it. I just want to show you the, the picture as well. This is a picture taken by my very good friend Jörn Persson uh, from Sweden. He is a photographer and he took all the pictures of uh, me for uh, CD covers, for my posters, for uh, flyers and everything. He, he's a fantastic photographer. And he and his wife, Katte, they were, uh, Katte is not with us anymore, but uh, I met them when I came to Sweden and we really hit it off and became wonderful friends. He took some wonderful pictures of this guitar. I can tell you this is not easy to use a flash on a shiny surface like the guitar. You need to know your angles. And now that I'm myself dealing with photography a lot, that, that's not easy, but th I wanted to show you this picture because it shows how uh, the bridge of the guitar uh, looks uh, when it's a little bit lit, and uh, that's this Brazilian rosewood bridge. Oh, that's right, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you something else about the guitar, and, and this is from the side. So it's the same rosewood here uh, on the sides of the guitar as is it's on this veneer, veneer, I don't know how it's called in English, I'm sorry, but you see this is the same material as a neck, so there is a thin layer of this uh, uh, rosewood that's coming on top of it, just to have this nice consistency when you, when you, when you see the guitar. And uh, one more thing about uh, the way Michael builds his guitars is this. If you can see the uh, angle that the strings are attacking the bridge. It's like a 45 degree angle that strings come out from these string tuning pegs, not tuning pegs, but uh, bridge pins, sorry. And they come uh, at the saddle with a very sharp angle. That can be a double-edged double sword because sometimes they think that it puts too much pressure on the top of the guitar and you don't get that much of movement in the top so that you can get smoother sound. I'm not so knowledgeable about that. I just know that this is, uh, it came with the guitar. All Michael's guitars are made this way and uh, they all sound great. One more specific thing about this is it's got the zero fret you can see here. 
which means uh, usual guitars, uh, they have a little saddle down here, and that's where the strings are passing and then coming onto the neck and all the way down. This, all Michael's guitars have zero fret, which means it's a metal on metal all the way, and it's, it gives you the consistency and string response, and let's say the volume of the guitar uh, is, okay, none maybe talking against myself or against some rules or some things that are kind of uh, accepted uh, when we talk about guitars, let's say, what do you mean? Do you want to say that this guitar is better than a Martin guitar that has a, a, a traditional little nut up here? No, I'm not saying it's better, but with Michael's guitars, you, you can see that, let's say, the, the volume of this chord There's no difference in volume. On the, on the guitar that doesn't have a zero fret, usually when you play the bare chords of the neck, it's going to diminish the volume just a little bit. Not too much, it's going to de decrease the volume just a little bit, and it's, it's the physics, because this way with the zero fret, uh, the strings are always touching the metal, and when you fret them up here, they're also meeting the metal. So it's metal on metal, gives better resonance, and that's it. One more thing that, that really is uh, very specific when it comes to, to Michael's guitars is the string separation and the way how, um, maybe I can show you like this. What I mean with uh, string separation, it's that even, okay, when you play like this, string by string, of course you're gonna hear every string uh, by itself. But if you play the chord, a little, just a little bit like, I brush the strings almost at the same time. Still, I can hear every note by itself. Especially when you play finger picking stuff like a, I just think uh, it's so inspiring to play this kind of guitar and to have this string separation where nothing gets muddy, no matter how you play it. And this is a totally acoustic sound. I, I'm not going through a pickup through the interface and to you as I've shown you in previous live streams because I, I can do the both, of course. But this is totally, uh, it goes to two condenser microphones called Octava. Uh, MK012. These are studio microphones that I got really, really cheap. So uh, they're very often used in studios for all kinds of recordings. So maybe not vocals really, but instruments, drums, ambient microphones, they're really great. Good. So I think we're, d we're, we're done with that part. So, and... Uh, I think we can just move to the today's theme, which I, again, I'd like to credit Tom. Tom Buck, right? Uh, his website uh, is called HiMyNameIsTom.com. What a fantastic rhyme. Really great. But he was talking about uh, Roadcaster Pro, this auto interface, in one of his videos, and he said, oh, uh, is it still worth it or is it worth it at all to spend so much money on an interface? How should you treat stuff when is something overkill and when is it oh, what it needs to be? If this depends on gear, it depends on personality, it depends on what you're doing with that gear. And I cannot really draw the same analogy 
between cameras, audio interfaces, and guitars, mostly because when it comes to guitars, there are several other factors that really, you know, uh, play a significant role, which means you can have the world's best guitar if you don't have the right humidity, and if you let them dry out, uh, they're gonna get cracks, they're, they're not gonna sound as they should, uh, the next could, you know, go bad, uh, necks could break, the tops could break, um, the necks that haven't been treated or adjusted for, for a number of years, they're not going to be, you're not going to be able to adjust them if they go bowed too much or if they get warped. So, um, and the camera that, that, that you bought, let's say five years ago, it's still that same camera. Of course, if you didn't drop it on the floor, somebody else who you bought it from, it didn't <laughs> drop it on the floor. But basically, if, if camera is the same product, giving you exactly the same results as when it's bought. So, yeah. I'd like to quote Tom on this one. I said, I'm really not a fan of the idea that you have to deserve your gear. And that's what gave me this idea for, for today's live stream, for the title. But there's also this TV show called So You Think You Can Dance, right? Remember? But anyway, uh, of course, we should be financially responsible, says Tom. And we shouldn't have to go to death to buy something. But as long as we're having fun, that's all that matters. And we could just end this subject and this discussion right here. Because if you want to buy something that's really expensive, it's a handmade instrument, cost a fortune. By all means, you're welcome to do that. But there are some, uh, some issues when it comes to... to, to when is it the right time to buy things? Do we have to uh, come to a certain, certain level of playing skills in order to just update the guitars we're playing on? And, you know, that's the gray zone when, because if you already have a good guitar and you want the best one, that's basically uh, a matter of financial situation you have. Of course, that guitar that you're quite happy with, and which is maybe one of those middle priced models, it gives you a great sound. It's got a good pickup. You're out there playing. Nothing is wrong with the guitar, but you feel that, oh, I'd like to have something a little bit better. And you got a good economy. Knock yourself out. Just do it. No problem. Oh, let me just say hello to Abby. Hi. Abby's got some great instruments, and she knows definitely what I'm talking about when it comes to, let's say, dealing with vintage guitars. Guitars that were made in 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? Those guitars have tremendous value when it comes to the instrument history, when they were made, by whom. Uh, some factories were not as big as they are today. They had a much more personal approach to making instruments. And uh, they were not that standardized. Like today when you buy a guitar by Fender or Gibson, and I'm talking uh, basically acoustic guitars, but it goes for electric as well. It's so standardized, and you know you're getting a very similar, almost 100% similar quality of the stuff you, you're buying. And that's the other side of the whole equation. But let's say, let's stay with vintage instruments. Um, I just bought me this uh, silver tone guitar from late 50s, I think. The serial number points at between 1959 and 61. And that's going to be shown in one of the upcoming live streams when I'm showing my instruments. For those of you who came a little bit later, I've just uh, showed my uh, Sundian, uh, my main guitar, a couple of minutes ago. So welcome to go back and watch that. So um, the vintage guitars have their value. Historically, uh, who made them, which factory, 
and also who owned them. There is this very special thing when, when you're on the guitar fair and, and you find somebody who says, hey man, I've been to the States and I bought this guitar out of an old couple who had it since 1938 and uh, nobody played it. It was just in the attic and it's a bit, you know, it's a bit rusty. Like you, you really need to fix it. But, but you know, there you go. And then you kind of pay like $4,000 for that guitar just because it's that old, because it's only one owner. I, I mean, you get the picture, right? And some guitars are just great because they've been played for so long and everything that yours in the guitar, even if you buy an, an old Rezafana guitar from the 30s, let's say you buy a national made in 1938. And then, uh, I mean, that neck, if it's the same neck within with the same body that comes all the way from the late 30s to you today, there is a history, there is a sound, there is some chemistry in the instrument that just makes it a fantastic buy if you have the money. Hi Max, what's wrong? Kakwe. All right, Abby, one of the most authentic sounding guitars I have for Zeta Tharp and Josh White style is an old Echo that was 30 bucks from the ra uh, rag market. That's right. And I remember those Echo guitars uh, from the 60s. When I started playing guitar in 1975, I was like 15 and I was like, oh man, my dream guitar is this 12 string Echo from Italy because I thought it was the best guitar in the world. And then I discovered, oh, there are some other manufacturers as well. I just started playing. I didn't know. But a friend of mine had this Echo 12 string. It was fantastic. Wonderful guitar. I just loved it. Yeah. Lupus in fabula, as we say in Latin, right? We were just talking about you, and I credited you for, for the both your video uh, about the Roadcaster Pro, Is It Worth It?, and your podcast episode on Pro versus Beginner Gear. So um, I've come to this, uh, this gray zone. We say you're going to update your current instrument, which is really good maybe, and then you want to buy something that's really fantastic. That costs money, of course. And if I could just make a comparison. This guitar, my metal body, right? This is the... Uh, guitar made in Germany or assembled in Germany. Uh, there, there's a long history behind this guitar. It was designed in the late 80s by a German company called Ami GmbH or Ami Limited. And there were a couple of uh, guitar crazes who actually had uh, the, the, the dealership of Martin guitars, so they made some significant money by selling Martin guitars, but they really loved the old old timey stuff and they loved the blues and Rezaphonic guitars and they said, oh man, we want to make this Rezaphonic guitar, but we're not allowed to, to, to put it out on the market until 1991. Um, and I, I met them when I was living in Germany and I said, why not? They said, because National has got the patent on these guitars and nobody's allowed to make them until 1991. Right, so they were ready and we were working on these instruments and you know checking some prototypes and you know comparing them to original guitars and one of my best buddies ever, Reiner Wiffler, who is a fantastic guitar player and a very knowledgeable journalist uh, within blues from Germany, he um, owned a couple of really vintage great guitars very valuable so they had something to compare it so this is this was the end result and this is a total replica of the 1927 national tricone style one guitar it's a mouthful i know but for those who don't play guitar this means nothing but for you guys who who, who play guitar if you see here in the inside of this this area here there are three small resonators and there's this bridge that comes underneath this cover plate and then the strings are going over there and that's giving you this specific very metallic sound and basically those combs are like 
like a loudspeaker membrane just turned upside down and they just project the vibrations physical vibrations from the strings down into the body and they go out through these openings both on this part and in these ones if i i'm going to show it to you now the sound of it let's go to the let me see if i can find that first not zoomed out not that one here so uh i can show you um if i come to the microphones with this part of the guitar closer you will hear one dimension of the sound right now i'm going to turn this part where the cover plate is compare it again and this ladies and gentlemen is a fantastic example of how you can you know build a live sound if you're playing through a microphone which uh, bob brosman the late american fantastic guitar player uh, used to work with a sm57 microphone that was very close to his guitar but he was moving the guitar back and forth to the left and right and just attacking that microphone from the different parts of the guitar body giving you totally crazy sounds because if i do like this i can play the backup uh, with this upper part which means i'm using the neck pickup on an electric guitar and then i scream at you with the sound from here so i'll give you let's say the slide sound but when i'm playing the bassier sound it goes like this and then now i'm kind of in between now one of the microphones is turned to to this part and the other one is turned to this neck part and that's the most balanced sound i can get from this guitar when i'm playing in this live stream right <laughs> There's a reason why I placed them this way and I, the reason why I placed them let's say this far from the guitar, guitar and everything and it's depending a little bit of the room um, I don't I'm not using any reverb or any effects on the uh, Rodecaster Pro so well uh, that's a sound Tom says I've had my USA precision bass for a year now and I literally haven't thought of getting another bass in that time I guess it kind of saved me money by solving gas yeah definitely I used to have a Fender precision precision bass and the Fender jazz bass but there was that was out of sheer snobbery I was a snob when I was younger in my late 20s it was like a, I just bought the guitar because you were supposed to have a Stratocaster, Telecaster, Les Paul, even Les Paul Jr. if you're playing slide and uh, right. Um, Gibson SG wasn't that popular uh, among slide players until Derek Trucks kind of showed up and, and played it. But um, I mean that widely popular, popular. But uh, yeah, and I had both of those bases. I loved them, but I sold them to buy uh, which was that one other electric guitar that was a bit more vintage at that time because I was working a lot as a tour touring musician and I was recording a lot so I needed to have something that was on the guitar part of the arsenal not the basses so much so where am I in my script so continental versus uh, national resiphonic so this is a copy of an old national and when you compare this to a modern national guitar, uh, you will definitely see there's a difference in, in sound, 
in projection. This guitar has a much mellower sound. Uh, tricone guitars are usually quite mellow compared to single cone guitars. Single cone guitars have one resonator in this whole part and a single cone resonator is my little sand and I usually open play the open G, G tuning in and uh, those guitars are much punchier much bassier and uh, that's that dimension of the sound but tricones are something that I really personally love and that's this nice smooth basses nice smooth trebles and the metals are there when you need them which means if I play like a frequency range that tricones have and this neck was made by Yamaha in the beginning of the continental production so the necks were made in Japan in Yamaha's factory this is a, a, a plastic binding but it's really well done uh, then the bodies were made in Czech Republic and the cones inside were made in Hungary so it was like a Eastern Europe meets Japan and the guitars were assembled in, in Germany, and that was it. So, uh, and now, if somebody had asked me, hey, throw that guitar away, you're Continental, and we'll get you a National for half a price or something, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it. Because in some cases, when an instrument has a an history that's, you know, kind of tied to you, and this guitar has a history of me getting it. Uh, I think this is like a fourth or fifth guitar ever made by Ami, and now they're discontinued, nobody's making them. Uh, and they're not that expensive on, on a used market either. It's like a, okay, Continental, they're good. But I think that this is just a fantastic guitar, and Sam Mitchell, who I used to play with in the 90s, he used to have one, so we, we played with two uh, tricones on the stage, with exactly the same amplifiers and we were really smoking it because that sound was you know out of this world it was fantastic and the pickup that's in this guitar you see it's a um, uh, Chandler lipstick Armstrong Kent Armstrong pickup and that's not the little uh, lipstick pickup that's uh, that you can see in Fender Telecasters and other and maybe guitars. This is a full size real lipstick magnetic pickup from early 80s. And so we built them into these guitars, both Sammy and I, and we had a very, very uh, similar sound. So I wouldn't change that. Even if I had the money to buy the National, I wouldn't buy another tricone guitar ever because I just don't need it doesn't matter if it's the best in the world in other cases you may think like well Martin guitars are considered to be the best acoustic guitars in the world yes they may be that but for me any Gibson guitar from let's say 30s up to maybe 50s and 60s would be my preferred choice I, I, I just wouldn't buy a Martin because it doesn't doesn't suit my playing style so um today's theme i'm going to be showing you one more things that's right that's my guitar over there yep but let's go this is the person who made my guitar not this metal one but uh, the acoustic guitar my main guitar, Michael Sandon, and he's been in the business since 1982 when he built his first guitar. So um, now these are his new models just made and this is what's in stock right now. Um, this cutaway is something that's absolutely a you know 
work of art. It's fantastic, fantastic guitar. So let's just take a look at it. So this is a handmade guitar, and I mean, I wouldn't blame anybody going to death to buy this guitar. Sorry, Tom, but this is just fantastic. Workmanship, every little detail on Michael's guitars are just fantastic. When it comes to going to more traditional shapes and uh, bodies, this is a shorter scale length uh, acoustic guitar, also beautiful. And uh, that's going to come, I'll be showing you that one. This is, let's say, uh, another resophonic guitar, but this is with a uh, spider cone resonator. So it's like what you have in the banjo, where the cone is not turned uh, upside down. It's, as, as a, it's turned as, as a plate towards the strings, right? And then on the edges of that plate, there are these metal ribs. And that's where the string, the bridge, uh, is attached, and that's creating a very special sound. What else do we got? We got this absolute beauty guitar. So that's enough of Michael Sandon, uh, because uh, he's a very modest person, and he wouldn't want me to brag too much about it. But Go and check sandingguitars.com and you will see them. So, um, this is Tom's website. I just wanted to, to show you how it uh, looks and I would like to sh give you a shout out uh, to, to people to go and listen to our podcast because uh, Tom is not only talking about uh, for, for, uh, photo gear and microphones that he is m mostly known of, uh, he's also, um, you know, talking about sustainability. It, it, there are a lot of aspects in, uh, especially his, his podcasts, and uh, everything is fantastic. It's well done. It's down to earth. It's just fantastic. So, hi, my name is Tom. dot com. That's that. And now I'm going to show you something else. This is what I'm uh, going to meet next week. I'm going to this guitar fair in Gothenburg. And just to show you, you know, the perspective of, okay, how much can some guitars that are not new cost? And these are guitars that are mostly secondhand. And there's even one <laughs> Michael Sanda guitar that was made in 1980 something, 84. So only two years in business and Michael had this guitar. And that's priced at uh, around 2000 dollars, two thousand one hundred dollars uh, used, right? Very, very nice. And it shows the the way he made the, the bridge then compared to how he does it now. There's a difference. But uh, if we go back to, to this, you can see, let's say, this Gibson guitar. This is four thousand five hundred dollars. It's from 19... It's even prior to 1920. Abby here is a very knowledgeable person when it comes to vintage guitars. Maybe you know the model and everything, but it's, it's like these prices are just insane. Martin, $4,000. I don't know from which years this, but basically uh, guitar number one is, is a shop in Gothenburg that has, uh, oops, I'm not going to buy it. Sorry guys. Um, let's say 1934 an Archtop Martin that's really nice nice guitar definitely great but for me personally it's not worth that amount of money that's it sorry when it comes to uh, newer Martins if you just go to to you know a couple of sites that are selling Martin guitars there's this one in Germany Martin Custom Shop double O um, this guitar costs $9,500. I don't know. I don't know, guys. So, um, another aspect of, of, of all this is also that if you feel limited by what you've got for the moment, and that can be out of various reasons, let's say, we're getting old, and I'm getting a 
back pain and I have this very heavy Gibson Les Paul guitar or some jumbo guitar that really weights a lot maybe I want to buy a guitar that's lighter so I'll sell this one and buy another guitar maybe um, um, maybe I'm I bought a guitar with 12 frets and I want to start playing slide and I then want a guitar that has 14 frets to the body because let's say this guitar is kind of made to be played with slide but it doesn't have even not even 12 frets to the body because the old design from 27 uh, because of the you know physics of the whole dimensions of things of the scale length how neck is assembled to the body and everything dictated that the 12th fret wasn't exactly where the uh, neck meets the body it's a little bit in like 11 and 3 quarters frets be, uh, where you have the body joint so which means I always needed to think oh sorry I needed to think in the beginning to just reach a little bit further up if I wanted to get this nice octave on the 12th fret especially difficult to do this uh, on this guitar is to play chords on the 12th fret and further up the neck but then that's it so if somebody wants oh I'd like to have 14 frets to the body and that's it then you can buy a let's say a single cone guitar that has 12 frets and then 14 frets to the body and that's it um, somebody can maybe develop a hand pain issues you you the neck that you've always loved on your favorite guitars was a little bit you know thick in the beginning maybe it's this old-timey v-shaped neck and now you just can't play that you cannot press that hard anymore so you buy a new guitar so there are reasons where where when it's really kind of okay let's just switch let's buy it but to to the main subject of this live stream which is like okay but if I just want the best you know in the world the guitar that cost ten twelve thousand dollars and I have the money I'm just saying by all means go get it I have students asking me on my workshops I have people coming uh, to me on my gigs chatting afterwards and somebody says oh man you got these fantastic guitars with you I, you know I just have a, this kind of stock Fender beginner model and it's not really inspiring to play on that one I said well buy a better guitar I said, well maybe if I could just you know give it to somebody who who's in a repairman who, who can maybe maybe do a setup on it put a better kind of tuning pegs and, and maybe kind of adjust the neck and the string gauge and string height and all that maybe that would make it a, a better guitar yes it would it would improve it but would it make it much better no would you would you get much more volume as you maybe would wish to get no because as soon as you make a guitar comfortable to play and you go low with a string height uh, you're gonna lower the volume to it the higher the strings are the more volume because they're pressing the, the the top of the guitar more and that's an old rule so if you if you want to make guitar very comfortable to play you will lose something so um, I don't know so I'm getting questions like I'm not really good you know why should I buy such an expensive guitar who's to tell if somebody's good or not I've stated this many times uh, in these live streams that I don't like when people uh, are set to levels of guitar playing I call it stages on our musical journey it doesn't matter how much you can the whole point of 90% of my workshops are about improving someone's playing from the level not the level from the stage that they are at for the moment to the next one to a bit more knowledge to a bit more technical skills maybe to new chords that I can show somebody just to move you from point A where you're maybe stuck for a couple of years and then move you over to point B and then further on so everybody can improve and I my workshops are also about 
showing people who don't play that often and not they don't play that much how you can improve the arrangements that don't uh, require a lot of technical skills which means you don't have to play fast you don't have to play uh, complex chord shapes but you need to be aware of what you're picking with your picking hand and where you're fretting with your left hand which sounds natural it's like a, yeah of course i'm gonna have to know where i'm picking and what i'm picking yes but very often i see people fretting with their fretting hand correctly everything is fine but then their right hand doesn't really know what it's doing so the basics of the basics of finger picking right now i'm going to go to the third string and second with my index and middle finger now back to the second and first now the third and first As soon as you uh, really develop develop this awareness of where your fingers are picking, you're giving yourself 50-60% more chances to play some really nice exciting arrangements because the rest of the stuff is just fretting the right places on the neck, right? Let's say if we take this... Uh, playing the sixth third and the first string and I could let's say do something like this pick at the same time this is already a little bit syncopated if I just pick them uh, like this this would be the first stage of practicing. The syncopation and more musical part of playing this will be like this. And then you get some gliding to the note. The next stage would be to play these strings in a matter of picking but not at the same time like a so already here within this minute and a half of me just fooling around with this gave you let's say 10 different exercises things that you can just implement in your playing in open D tuning just like this by being aware that we're picking the first third and the sixth string if you just change that to the first second and and, uh, and the sixth then you get this So sometimes I just recommend people just fool around and just choose a couple of strings that you're going to pick no matter what you do with your fretting hand and just experiment with that. Okay. Uh, let me just see what Abby was. Oh, sorry. There was one comment before that. It's important to have an instrument that inspires you and makes you want to play it, definitely. Sound and feel wise, yes, and different guitars can really change the way you play. By all means, absolutely. But also, you don't necessarily know what you want until you've been playing for a while. Definitely, of course, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend somebody who's just starting to play the guitar to get a Martin that costs $5,000, yeah, but, if you're in a family where somebody already has a great guitar and you're just starting off, wow, you're lucky. That's perfect. I have a friend who, who is a hobby guitar player. He, um, he bought himself a nice Martin uh, uh, stock model. Not that expensive, but Martin. And he bought it to have it home and play it and you know, enjoy it. Sometimes when he feels like playing, that's great. He even came to one of my retreats and you know very solid player 
but he doesn't play that often. But his son started playing the guitar. And a couple of months ago, I asked him, I asked him like, so are you maybe coming to this year's retreat? And he said, no, no, I, I actually don't have a guitar anymore. My son just took it with him, or he let him take it with him. It's like, okay, I get it now. So if you're in that kind of situation, that's fantastic. But definitely, of course, you need to um, come to a certain stage of your playing when you can appreciate different sounds, different dimensions of sounds. Uh, and all that. And it's, let's go back to Tom. He, he was um, also mentioning that... Uh, um, oh, shit, where was it? I lost it. But let's say, if, 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 you, uh, if, you, if you have that, um, let's say, camera gear, right? If something is inspiring to, 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 to use and you use it, it's always better to become a master of what you got for the moment than to just jump on new stuff and buy a new model of that camera or even different model, even newer stuff and more expensive stuff before you really learned and mastered the current model that you were having. It goes very, very uh, similar to, to the guitars. Every time you, you want to buy a new instrument, you think, oh, this is not, maybe, maybe you should try to play something else on that guitar. Maybe it would suit great to be played with a slide uh, or open tunings. Some guitars are great for flat picking, usually dreadnought guitars that have a shape of a you know pier. Um, they're great for uh, flat picking, playing with a pick, playing, playing large chords when you accompany yourself and uh, playing contemporary rock music and stuff. But if you want to play old-timey blues, then those guitars are not really so... But who am I to tell? I've seen a lot of great players playing all kinds of finger picking, including Doc Watson, who played a dreadnought Gallagher guitar. So there are no such hard rules over there anyway. But think of one thing. Um, um, the great used guitars uh, versus top-notch, newly produced guitars. That's also something to consider. Uh, if, there's, if the price is the same, let's say if you could buy an old Gibson L4 for $3,000 and then you can buy a new Martin for $3,000. Is it the same value? It depends on you and your playing style and what you want to do with that guitar. Um, and the same, uh, you know, the vintage guitar that costs like $4,000 and then a handmade guitars for $4,000 that was made now by a luthier. And the last point for today is actually to tell you that, um, okay, let's put it this way. When, when I bought my guitar from Michael and when he fulfilled my, my wishes for the measurements, you know, dimensions of the guitar, how it was made, a deeper body, I had my reasons for that, so he made it for me, that's, a fantastic value and that's something that you know just hooked me together with that instrument and that's for me more more worth than any other guitar in the world because when you buy a handmade guitar from a living person who you maybe know uh, you don't have to be you know friends or something but let's say you know who made the guitar and that's one person from scratch to the finished guitar uh, that's that's fantastic. So there's a lot of value in, in, in a that's the real pro of owning a handmade guitars. Then it comes to partly to sustainability. Both of the guitar maker himself or herself, let's not forget the female fantastic guitar makers like Linda Masner from Canada, amazing guitars, Pat Metheny plays them. Um, sustainability when it comes to materials as well because we're not harvesting half of China or India or Africa for this uh, fantastic mahogany, sapele mahogany uh, to, to put them in, in these serially made uh, uh, guitars that will in the end cost you like $250. Uh, there is more sustainability if a uh, guitar maker like Michael, I know how he gets his woods and all other materials. He, he travels the world 
and finds great uh, wood everywhere and then he buys a supply for maybe 50 guitars in advance at the same time that wood will be lying in his workshop for at least three years before he makes a guitar out of it so that's that aspect as well and of course it's made according to your specifications nowadays michael mostly does makes guitars out of his own kind of I don't know desires. He 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 likes these new designs. You've seen this guitar I showed you before uh, this, with this crazy cutaway and uh, some shapes. He he's experimenting with the sizes of the guitar. Uh, not all the guitars have the scale length of 650 millimeters, which is like standard. Uh, some are quite shorter. And then there's this baritone guitar. I'll be showing you that in the next live stream next week. Yeah. So. Uh, Oh, there was one more thing. The last one, I promise, I'll let you go. Uh, if you have a vintage guitar or a very expensive guitar that you really worked hard for, and then you bought it, and then you get a booking, and you're supposed to fly across the world to play, as when I was flying to Georgia four years ago to play on a festival, and I had to change planes in uh, I flew from Copenhagen to Istanbul and then from Istanbul to Belize in Georgia and then we were driven uh, for like three and a half hours to the venue. Um, that was a tricky one because I thought okay maybe I should just borrow a guitar or maybe I should just take with me this silver tone which is a vintage guitar but I mean I wouldn't die if I lost that guitar in transportation somehow. Uh, it killed me if I lost my main guitar right but I thought you know what I'll give it a go and I just try my luck because the only time I lost the guitar lost is the, when I was uh, flying to Germany and then the guitar went to Singapore for, for a couple of days and then they delivered it in Germany so I played a couple of gigs on the borrowed guitars and that was it but that's also an aspect of if you're traveling a lot maybe it's not always the best idea to take this most expensive guitar with you right so um, I, I, I know a couple of pro players who who had these very meticulously set up guitars that are not very expensive that have great pickups in them so they're great live guitars you wouldn't kill for that acoustic sound in any way but they use that on tours and then they enjoy their pretty expensive guitars at home that's also a way um, yeah so it's like buy what you can afford and what will make you happy nobody says that you need to be on a certain level or stage of your musical journey it's just a matter of the preference your financial uh, stretch and how you want it and I really, really wish you a good luck of getting a guitar of your dreams and let me know when you've bought it, right? So, uh, yeah, that would be that for today. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, let me see if there was something else in the chat that I maybe missed here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, Albert, Gare, Graham, Abby, who I'll meet uh, this summer we're going to be teaching during the blues week program in late july beginning of august uh max here with the crazy youtube tag lushemir sirovsky that's great actually it's my old buddy from former yugoslavia sounds polish this this name and Abby, of course, Tom Buck, thank you for coming. Uh, and Abby, Abby, that was it. Thank you so much for today. And uh, I'll be delighted to see you next week. And then I'm going to be showing my baritone guitar. And we'll go through all 10 of them. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you next week.
that was a spray One sunny day My sweetheart left me Now she went away Now she's gone And I don't worry But I'm sitting on top of the world And she called me up Down and out by soul Come back, Daddy. Thought I need you so. Now she's gone, and I don't worry. Cause I'm sitting on top of the world. Don't you shake my tree Get out of my orchard Let my feet just be Now she's gone I don't worry But I'm sitting on top of the world She's gone, I don't worry, 